Let us bow our heads for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we come, we come to you this morning. Uh, would you uh, just humble our hearts that we may be able to truly open up our eyes uh, and see the truth that is still being proclaimed to us through your word. Father God, I do ask that you would bestow your blessings upon us, uh, that we may be able to uh, be renewed, uh, to be true servants of yours in this day and age. Father, uh, as we come into your presence, cover us up with the precious blood of Jesus Christ, your Son, and anoint, and anoint us uh, with the Holy Spirit as you speak to us tonight, uh, this morning. I give this time into your hands, and in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning. Um, I'm going to introduce myself a little bit for those of you that, for those of you that do not know me. Uh, some of you actually have um, seen me before. Um, my name is Daniel Kim, and uh, uh, where do I even begin? I was born in Korea, uh, raised, in, raised in Korea until I was 10, and I moved to uh, Japan, where my father was born and raised. And uh, in Japan, I lived another, uh, I lived another 10 years of my life, uh, starting 10 years old until I graduated from high school. And uh, you, you may be thinking already, uh, where did he pick up his, his English? Well, uh, while I was in Japan, um, my parents have sent me uh, to, uh, to an American school in Japan. That's where I picked up my English. So elementary school years, junior high and high school, I spent in Japan. And uh, after 10 years of, 10 years of uh, my life in Japan, I left to the U.S. I spent four years in Charleston, South Carolina, where I went to uh, a military academy. As soon as I graduated, I moved to Chicago to go to seminary for six years. And then, after 10 years of my life in the U.S., I finally left to, uh, to go out to China uh, as my mission space. And I'm serving the Lord ever since. Um, that's been, what? This, this is my eighth year as a missionary. Well, um, it's definitely a pleasure to return to um, the Church of Resurrec Resurrection uh, to uh, just share the Word of God with you this morning. Um, it's been a while since I actually uh, spoke in English, so I don't know how, how, how well it's going to come out, but uh, bear with me if it's uh, a little stiff, a little bit. I need to warm up a little bit. It usually takes about a, it take, takes about a week for me to actually get, get the language back. But uh, it's been, what, three days since I came back? Four days? So, I'm, uh, you know, still, still getting there. So bear with me if, if it doesn't flow. Um, for the last eight years, I've been traveling to uh, different parts of the world. And God's been revealing to me a lot of things of, um, about, about his kingdom. And one of the things that I um, was able to witness out there in the world is this. The kingdom of God is very near. His, his return, his return is uh, drawing very close. Um, as, you, as you and I already know, this world is falling apart right now. And uh, it seems like uh, the time of his return, the time for the fulfillment of his promise um, is, is, is drawing very near. Um, you know, we can talk about this all, mor all morning. Um, you know, Jesus talks about it in Matthew chapter 24. In the last days, there's going to be earthquakes, there's going to be famines, there's going to be uh, persecutions, there's going to be uh, antichrists, on and on and on and on. We can talk about it all, all morning, but we're not going to do that. But we're, we're going to talk about one thing. Um, in Matthew chapter 24, um, Jesus talks about all these things, the, the signs of the last day. And one, one, interesting, one interesting thing he, he says after that is this, all these things, all these things must take place, but that's not the end. And he kind of threw Jesus' disciples off. And Jesus' disciples, uh, they were looking at, looking at Jesus, and Jesus actually continued. He actually said, but learn from the le lesson of a fig tree. Learn from the lesson of a fig tree. If you look at Matthew, tw Matthew chapter 24, um, you, you, that, you're, you're going to actually uh, encounter a question. You know, what, what is this fig tree that Jesus is talking about? You know, in order to really understand what that fig tree is, you have to actually re uh, return to the previous chapters. 
what happens up to the point uh, of Matthew chapter 24, uh, what leads up to that event in Matthew chapter 24 really defines what fig tree is when Jesus talks about it in Matthew chapter 24. Um, before that, before, before that, Matthew chapter 24, Jesus and his disciples were about to enter uh, into the, the city of Jerusalem. And Jesus was so hungry, he actually um, saw a fig tree, thinking there was a fig. So he drew near, and he was looking for, uh, for, for its fruit. And he couldn't find any fruit. So he, he, he curses the tree, saying, you know what? You look like you, you're going to be fruitful. You, you look like this tree looks like it, it, it is fruitful, but it bears no fruit. It's hypocritical. And he curses the tree. He walks into the city of Jerusalem. He goes teaches, he, he goes, teaches at, the, uh, at the temple. And that's when he encounters the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And he uses the fig tree example um, to... Uh, to speak to the Pharisees, saying, you guys are just like the fig tree. You guys may, look, may appear fruitful, but inside, you have no fruit. And God's going to pluck, pluck you out of this ground. God's going to destroy Israel. He talks, about the, uh, he, distru- he talks about the destruction of Israel. And right after that, he, he exits the city of Jerusalem, and his disciples saw the fig tree completely withered. And this following event takes place up in the, uh, up in the uh, Mount of Olives right after that. Jesus, looking down to the temple, temple of God, uh, he talks about the destruction of the temple. He talks about the destruction of the city. And he talks about there's going to be earthquakes in the last days. He's, he talks about there's going to be warfares. And all these things are going to happen. And he says, all these things must take place, but that's not the end. And he says, learn from the lesson of a fig tree. And when he says that, when he says that, what do you think Jesus', Jesus disciples thought in their, in their minds? What kind of fig tree is he talking about? He's obviously referring to the fig tree that he cursed earlier in, 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 in the previous chapter. He was talking about fig tree. He was saying, this fig tree is destroyed. This fig tree is completely withered. This fig tree is completely cursed. But one day, when the, when the right time comes, this fig tree will, will be restored. When the time of the restoration of fig tree comes, Jesus says, the summer has come. And what's the big deal about summer? It's not a, definitely not a vacation time. And when Jesus talks about summer... You got to remember that according to the Jewish calendar, summer is the last season of the year. Do you, do, do you know that the word for summer in Hebrew is exactly the same word for the end? And Jesus says, one day this fig tree is going to be restored. The fig tree that you saw withered, this fig tree is going to be restored again. It's going to be lively again. And indeed, it's going to bear fruits once again. And when that time comes, the end does come. And like I said earlier, this fig tree is referring to Israel. This fig tree is referring to the people of Jews, uh, uh, people of Israel. He's saying, you know, this temple is going to be destroyed, and Israel is going to be destroyed. But one day in history, Israel is going to be restored again. And when that time comes, when that time comes, the end has come. What's going on? Let's look at history a little bit. In A.D. 70, A.D. 70, um, Israel was invaded by the Roman, uh, Roman armies, and it was completely destroyed. The temple, completely destroyed. And ever since then, uh, the Roman government has changed the name of Israel to Palestine so that the scattered Jewish people may not return to Israel anymore. And that's when, you know, that's when history began, you know, uh, for Christianity. And as completely Israel was destroyed, uh, gospel was taken to different parts of the world for the last 2,000 years. And then finally, um, it reached us, right? For the last 2,000 years, there was, no, the, there, there was no kingdom of Israel. And the Jewish people, they were pretty much homeless. You know, they were going from one country to another, trying to find a place to, um, to, to find shelter, you know? But uh, in, eight, uh, in 1946, in 19, uh, 1947, 
um, Israel as a nation is restored. Have you actually, can you actually imagine a country that disappeared for 1,870 years to be restored in one day? Israel was gone for 1,870 years, but in 1947, it, it is restored. About 20 years later, 1968, Jerusalem returned from Palestine, Jerusalem restored. And for the last 50 years, you know what's going on? All the Jewish people are returning back into Israel. How do you explain this? How do you explain this? Israel, for the first time in 2,000 years, for, for the first, first time in 2,000 years, restored. Jerusalem, restored. All the Jewish people returning. It's, n- it's not a surprise. You know why? Because according to, uh, according to prophet Jeremiah, he actually talks about this. He says, when the time comes... When the time comes, in the last days, I'm going to bring back all the remnants from the four corners of this earth. Do you, do you know in China, it's really interesting, there's a place called Kaipeng in China. It's, it's, a western, it's a northwestern part of China. And uh, as you know, chi- China is actually made up uh, of many, uh, many minority groups. You know? uh, there are, uh, there's Chao Xianzu, and there's the, the Chang and there's the, uh, the Uyghurs. There's many different minority groups living in China. But if you look at the Chinese his- history, until the beginning of 1900s, there was actually a minority group called Yotairen, meaning the Jews. They were all living in a place called Kaipeng, a city of Kaipeng. But one day, in the, the Chinese history says, in, in the beginning of 1900s, there's all these Jewish people living in Kaipeng area, Chinese Jews, they said, you know what? We don't belong here. Let's pick up and let's go back to our country. It, just, it was just a matter of a few months. All the Chinese people decided to just move out of China, go back to Israel. How do you explain this? God says throughout the Old Testament, over and over, uh, through the words of many prophets, he says, you know what? I'm going to bring back my remnants when the time comes. In the last day, I'm going to bring back all my remnants from the four corners of this earth. I'm going to rebuild this nation. And God is saying, you know what? Earthquake, fam- earthquakes, famines, all these natural disasters, those are not the t- timetable that God has. But if you look at the Israel, if you look at what's going on with Israel, you can pretty much gauge how far we've come. You can pretty much gauge how near the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God has come. Brothers and sisters, I'm, I, can, I, can, I can talk about this all night, but if, because of the time's sake, I'm going to go on. But I'm going to tell you, just by looking at Israel, we, we, we already know the time is drawing very near, and we're, we're actually running out of time. And because of that, God is telling us over and over, prepare, prepare for the last day. There are three things we're going to examine today through this passage. How do we prepare? How do we pre- how, how do we prepare? See, I, I was actually preaching in Korean until last night, and it's a it's a big shift for me to actually um, you know be in the mode of the EM pastor, and uh, you know it's a little different. Uh, there's a linguistic warfare going on in my head right now. Konnichiwa, I say hello, ni So it's, it's, there's a warfare, so fight with me. Anyways, so how how do we prepare? How do we prepare? Anyways, yeah. And the Bible says there are three things you must, you must remember. Number one, stay awake until the end. Number two, prepare by managing with the heart of the master. Number three, serve as much as you, as much as you have received. Number one, stay awake. Number two, manage. Number three, serve. These are the three things that we're going to examine from this passage briefly. Number one. So stay awake until the end. In verses 35 to 40, Jesus talks about a master that goes off to a wedding banquet. And he says, until the master returns, his servants are supposed to stay awake. Who is going to be a faithful servant who's going to stay awake? And when the master returns, who's going to be that servant who's going to be able to open the door immediately? What does it mean to stay awake in this last day, in this last day and age? There are three things that we, 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 we want to remember. And number one, Jesus, said, Jesus says, stay awake as the one who escapes from the land. 
In verse 35, the, ver the passage goes, I, I have the ESV, English, English standard, standard Version. It says, stay dressed for action and keep your lamps burning. Stay dressed for action and keep your lamps burning. But I, I, I kind of want to make a little adjustment with the translation because that's not an accurate translation. According to the Greek, the original word, original, uh, original version, the actual translation would be something like this. Let your loins be girded about and your lamps burning. Not stay dressed for action and keep your lamps burning. That's kind of mellow, you know. The, the actual translation is something like this. Let your loins be girded about and your lamps burning. You know, when, Jew, when Jewish people used to dress, you know, not, not, not something like this, but they used to dress the, the actual robe. So when they, when they were about to run, when they were, when they were about to, uh, you know, uh, when they were about to um, go, go travel a long distance, what they used to do is they would take the skirt of their robes, they would actually tuck it in to their belt. And that expression is uh, girding up your loins, girding up your loins. And Jesus is saying, he, he's saying, stay awake. How? Stay awake as the one who escapes from the land by letting your loins be girded about and let your lamps burning. What does that mean? You know, if you, if you look at the entire Bible, Jesus is actually not the first person who actually says that. Many thousand years ago before Jesus, somebody else, somebody else actually say, said exactly the same thing. You know who that person is? It's our, it's our, Lord, it's our Lord Jehovah, our, our God, the God of Israel. He actually says to the, to the people of Israel on the night of Passover, he says, Exodus chapter, he says in Exodus chapter, uh, chapter 12, verse 11, he says to his people, he says to his, his people I'm going to read this for you. He says, this is how you should eat it, the, eat, eat the Passover meal. He says, with your loins girded up, with your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. God is saying, you know what? This is going to be the last night you're going to be spending in the land of Egypt, the place where you're, uh, you're, where, where you're slaves. And after tonight, through the miraculous work of God, you're going, to be, uh, you're, going to be, you're going to be escaping from this land. You're going to start your journey towards that uh, eternal promised land where, where God has promised to your uh, ancestors. But tonight, this is going to be the last night. Gird it up. Pack up. You know, just let, let, let go of this land. You're going to start a journey. And this is going to be the last night. Be ready for action. That's what it means. And Jesus is saying, many thousand years later, Jesus comes to his disciples and says, you know what? This time, this, the time of history that you're living in, this is the time where God is trying to rescue his people out of this land to take you home to, into the eternal promised land. So you should live this time of your life as if you're escaping from this land, as if you're escaping from, uh, where, 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 from where you are. The place where you are, the life that you're living in, is not going to be permanent. It's not going to be eternal. It's not going to be ultimate. But there is an ultimate home waiting for you. There's an eternal home waiting for you. There's a permanent home wait waiting for you. So tonight, this is going to be the last night. This life is going to be the last life. God's going to take you, take your hands, and he's going to, make you res he's going to rescue you into the eternal home. Gird it up. Pack up. Be ready. Let this land go. So how do we stay awake? God is saying, let it go. God is saying, pack up. God is saying, get your hearts ready. You're escaping. You're coming out of this, uh, the, the kingdom of Sodom and Gomorrah, and we're going to head home. Let's go home. Brothers and sisters, do you feel like you're going to be living here on this earth uh, forever? Do you think this, is, this, this life that you're living in right now, do you think that's going to probably last forever? But God is saying, you know what? This is only temporary. This is only passing. This is only transitory. This is only uh, partial. But there is something ultimate coming. Unless you let this life go, and unless you really, really start looking at the ultimate life that is coming, you're not going to be able to wake up. You're not going to be able to wake up from your life. You're not going to be able to wake up from the deep sleep of uh, deep sleep of death that you're, that, that, you're already, uh, that you're already sleeping in. 
Number two, how do you stay, how do you stay awake? Number two, stay awake as the one who is faithful to respond. And according to the Old Testament, uh, when, uh, when the Jewish people says, you know what, I'm going to gird it up, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to gird it up, that usually meant I'm going to be ready for action. I'm going to be I'm going to be ready to respond. I'm going to be ready to uh, to to serve whatever ma- uh, serve my master. I'm going to be ready to respond to whatever my master uh, actually tells me to do. So, according to the Bible, girding up means be in the position of faithfulness. You know. Um, have you actually have, have you actually seen someone falling asleep as that person is running? You, you've never seen that person, right? Nobody falls asleep while that person is running the race. Usually, when you stop the race, that's when you fall asleep. That's exactly so with our spiritual life. You don't fall asleep because uh, you, uh, you don't um, you don't uh, you stop you don't stop. Anyways, okay, I'm fighting here. You don't stop running the race because you fell asleep. But God is saying, you fall asleep because you, somewhere along the line, you've stopped, you, you've stopped running. You see the difference? Many times we feel like, oh, man, I, I fell asleep spiritually. You know, why, why is my life so, you know, so boring? And somehow my, my, my heart is so cold. And you know, it's really hard to let my, you know, keep my faith, faith going. It's really, really, really hard to, you know, keep on running the race. Why is this happening to me? But God is saying there's nothing weird about it. Somewhere along the line, you've given up. That's why you're falling asleep. It's not the, it's not the other way around. You don't stop running the race because you've fallen asleep. But God is saying, you've stopped the race. You've given up somewhere. You've let it go somewhere. That's why you're falling, falling asleep spiritually. Don't blame on God. Don't blame on your environment. God is saying, you've made that conscious choice to prioritize your life. And God was not one of them. And that's when you start falling asleep. In other words, if you really want to wake up from your deep sleep of uh, uh, deep spiritual sleep, somewhere, you, got, you, got, you, you have to make a decision. God, from today on, I'm going to be faithful to you. Whatever you say, whatever you say I'm, going to re- I'm going to be ready to respond. That's when you start waking up to your life. Number three, how do you stay awake? Stay awake as the one who can recognize the master. You see, um, Jesus talks about this. He says, uh, a, a master goes off to a, for, uh, uh, to, to a foreign land, to go, go, goes off to a ba- wedding banquet, and uh, he, he actually um, t- tells his uh, servants, you know, I'm going to come back someday, and nobody knows exactly when I'm going to come back. Because, you know, the, the wedding ceremonies that we think of is a little different from the wedding ceremonies that used to be held back 2,000 years ago d- during Jesus' time. The wedding ceremonies that we think of is, you know, Saturday afternoon, you know, we get dressed, you know, drive 30 minutes, and you, you attend to the wedding service for, uh, for, for 35, uh, 35 to 40 minutes. And after that your wedding reception, you just hang out with your friends, and that night, you come home. But when Jesus talks about the wedding banquet, you got to remember, that was 2,000 years ago. There was no transportation, the transportation that we have back then. So how would people travel? Many months before the wedding, people, people would actually start traveling. They would, actually tell, uh, they would actually tell their servants, you know what? I'm actually going, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go to a wedding banquet in a certain, certain place, and it's going to take months to get there. And I'm going to probably uh, attend the wedding service and uh, w- wedding ceremony, and that's going to probably uh, last, for, last se- several months. And by the time the wedding ceremony is over, and it's going to take another several months for me to get back. So I don't know when I'm going to come home, but sometime next year, I'll come back. So be ready, all right? And the, and the master starts the journey. And, you know, it takes a, takes a sheep and cow, goats, and whatever, you know, to the wines and, you know, just some, some, food, some food for the road. And he starts their journey and takes several months just to get to, the, get, get, get to the wedding banquet. So the wedding ceremony is not just one day because there are people, guests, wedding guests coming from far and from near. So wedding, according to um, just the wealth that you have, um, it really varies. Certain families, the wedding ceremony lasts for, for, for about three months. Certain families, the wedding ceremony actually lasts for about a year. If you're a king, 
And the wedding ceremony actually lasts for about three years. So how long, it depends on how long the wedding ceremony is, it, the wedding banquet is, that really defines the wealth that you have. So just think about it. Even just a round trip alone, it takes several months. It takes about a year. So nobody knows. Nobody knows when he's going to come back. And he, he actually comes home and says, you know what, I'm home. You know, we don't, don't think about Toronto. Don't think about Chicago. Don't think about anywhere else. This is 2,000 years ago, back in Jerusalem. There's no streetlights. The master comes home for the first time in a year. You have to recognize him. And Jesus says, who's going to be a faithful servant who's going to be able to open the door immediately? That's, that, those are the exact words. He says, immediately. How do you recognize your master immediately? You haven't seen him for about a year. You weren't expecting him. How do you, how, how do you respond? You got to remember, uh, when you talk about the master and the servant, you know, we have these tendencies. You know, there's one master, there's about 10 servants in a, per, uh, per, in, uh, in, in a, in a house. But this is 2,000 years ago, once again, in Jewish family. The servants, number of servants that we're talking about is not just 10, not just 20, but in an average family for a decent wealth, for average family, the number of servants uh, that, that were serving a master in each household were about 100 to 400, which means certain servants actually have spoken to the master. Certain servants actually have uh, had an experience to really, you know, see what the master looks like. But certain servants, they've never really met, met the master. Certain servants, they've really never had a single conversation with the master. And the master comes home at night. There was no street lights. And he, he, he came home for the first time in a year. You have to recognize him immediately. How? And Jesus is saying this. There are certain servants that have seen me, that have met me, that is familiar with my voice, that continued to have this intimate relationship with me. So even if I come home in the middle of the night, that servant would be able to recognize me. So how do you stay awake? You don't stay awake as just a churchgoer. You can't stay awake as a churchgoer because, you know, how do you recognize him? Jesus is the only way, the only way you can recognize a master when he comes, when he comes back in the middle of history. The only way to recognize him is for you to have that deep, intimate relationship with him you're familiar with his voice. You're familiar with his face. Even if he comes back in the middle of the human history, you're going to be able to recognize him right away. So the question, that, the question, the question is, do you know him? Or are you, just a, are you just attending churches? Are you just worshiping? Are you just used to worship? And if you look at you know, youth group kids, they're pretty, pretty interesting. Now, I, I, I speak to a lot of youth group students. It's really interesting. Youth group students... As soon as they hear the drums, as soon as they hear the guitar, youth group students, they know exactly how to worship. They know at which verse, how to raise hands. They know exactly how to respond to certain words. It's almost like the Pavlov's dog. You're classically conditioned. A pastor prays, you know exactly how to respond to that. A preacher preaches, you know exactly how to, pre- uh, how to, how to respond to that. There are certain cues throughout the prayers, and without even thinking about it, people respond, amen, amen, and what did I just pray? I don't know. Or just classically conditioned to respond like this. Many times we deceive ourselves thinking that we're Christians, but we're not, we're not even Christians many times. We're just church goers, or we're just classically conditioned to respond to certain ways as the worship carries on. But God is saying, do you really know me? Even if I come back in the middle of history, are you going to be able to recognize me? Stay awake. Number two, manage with the heart of the master. It's going to be shorter this time. 41 to verse 44, but I'm not going to read it. Like I said, the, 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 the master goes off to the wedding banquet, and he doesn't come home for about a year. What do you do? If you're a master of the house, and if you're not going to be, if you're not going to be home for about a year, what do you do with your wealth? You entrust your entire wealth to your servants that you trust. And when the master returns, 
depends on how that, how that, how that servant managed the wealth, depends on how that, uh, how that servant really managed the household, you're going to be able to either reward the servant or condemn the servant. And Jesus is saying, you know what? I have entrusted so many things to you. I've given you youth. I've given you wealth. I've given you time. I've given you health. I've given you church. I've given you uh, just freedom to worship. And when I return, I've given you all these things, all my possessions, for you to manage it with the heart of the master. How did you manage your, how did you manage your wealth? How did you manage the time that you have? It's not my time. It's not, it's, it's, it's not my wealth. It's the master's wealth. It's, not, it's the master's time. He has entrusted all these things to us, saying, you know what? I will return. Until then, manage it with my heart. And if you look at verse 42, 42 Jesus says, who's going to be that faithful and wise manager? And Jesus actually requires us to be, a, to be a wise person. What does it mean to be wise, brothers and sisters? What does it mean to be wise? A wise servant who's going to be able to manage with the heart of the master. What does it mean to be, to be wise, to be able to manage it well? You know, um, in Ephesians chapter 5, this was actually um, yesterday's uh, Korean, Korean services passage. In Matthew, uh, Ephesians chapter 5, uh, Apostle Paul actually defines what wisdom is. He says, look carefully then how you should walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time, for the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. In other words, in order to be wise, you have to understand what the will of the Lord is, because that's the standard that's going to be able to guide you through, because that's going to be able to uh, help you to discern what is the will of God and what is not the will of God. Understanding the will of God is the only key for us to be able to uh, go through these com- com- complexities of this earth, to be able to uh, truly perform as, as a good and faithful manager of, uh, of the master. You see, um, I'm going to ask you a question. Then what is one thing that Jesus wants? What is one thing that Jesus wants? Many of us have this you know, tendencies to really try to explain away what, you got, what, what God wants. But there's one thing that God desires for Christians to know. You know what that is? Oh, God wants me to be happy. But I'm going to ask you, when, where, where does it say in the Bible that God wants me to be happy? Nowhere. In fact, the word happiness is not used in the Bible. Do you realize that? Therefore, happy Christianity doesn't exist. What does God want us to have? What, what, what does God want us to know? There's one thing. You know what that is? There's one desire that God has. And if you look at history, you can actually pretty much guess what that, what, what that one thing is. Do you realize that human history is actually to, uh, flowing towards only one thing? The entire human history is going towards one thing. One last event of human history that's going to conclude everything. You know what that is? Jesus Christ's second coming. Many of us deny that. But Jesus says, you know what, I'm going to come back, I'm going to come back, I'm going to come back. If you look at the first coming, if you really, if you're a believer of the first coming, you have to believe the second coming. Because do you know that only 30% of Jesus Christ's prophecies are about to, uh, uh, are about the first coming. The 70% of the prophecies regarding Messiah is about the second coming. And 30% of the prophecies say, you know what, there's the Messiah coming, there's Messiah coming, I'm going to send the Deliverer, I'm going to send the Redeemer. Did he come or not? He came 2,000 years ago. 70% of all the prophecies in the entire Bible says he's going to come back again, he's going to come back again, he's going to come back again. Do you think he's going to come back or not? Yes, he will, yes, he will come back. Do you realize the entire human history is point, pointing toward one thing? One true event that's going to actually take time, that's going to take place in the human history, and that's going to conclude everything. You know what that is? Jesus Christ's second coming. And God so desires so much of that to happen. You know why? Because no matter what you do, everything's temporary. But on that day, that's going to be the final victory. Let's say we pray, God, you know, help, help me, you know, answer my prayers, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm in pain, you know, I, I have this hurt. But let's say God really fixes that problem. Well, so what? As long as you're breathing, 
until the day that you die, you're going to encounter another problem. You're going to cry again, and you're going to have many more problems throughout your life. But on that day when Jesus returns, that's going to be the dead end of all the problems. He's going to abolish evil. He's going to abolish all the sins. He's going to destroy the evil powers, and he's going to restore justice and peace on earth. The final victory. Let's say somebody, somebody, dies, on, you know, somebody dies today, and you know, as a pastor, I go there and I pray for that person, and for some miraculous reason, that person comes back alive. People say, wow, that's great, but so what? That person is bound to die again someday. But on the day that Jesus returns, Jesus says, there's no more death. If you were God, what would you want? Some temporary aspirin for life? Or do you want, if you were God, do you, would, you, would you want the final victory, the final solution, eternal solution, a permanent solution, an ultimate solution? If you were God, what would you do? There's one thing that God wants. I'm going to return. I'm going to finish it. You know, I, I, I really can't wait until Jesus to return. And I'm, I'm sure you feel the same way. Right? I'm sure you do. You know why? Because our inner selves do, although we don't realize many times. Think about it. Why do you think, why do you think um, Cinderella story is so famous? Bestseller. You know why? That story somehow echoes something into our hearts and it provokes us to feel something that we have inside, but we, we can't really express it many times. What is the Cinderella story about? Do you, do you know what that Cinderella story is about? We're living, uh, this, we're living in this pathetic little world. We, we can't escape from it. You know, we, there's, there's so much injustice in, in, in my life, but one day my prince will come, and he's going to rescue me. He's going to take me to his home, and I'm going to live with him happily ever after. Cinderella, bestseller. You know why? That's the gospel. Sleeping Beauty, well, why do you think that's a bestseller throughout, the, throughout different times? It echoes the gospel. You know why? Right now, I'm in sleep, the deep sleep of, deep sleep of death. I can't, I can't wake up. But one day, my prince will come. He's going to slay the dragon. He's going to kiss me. He's going to kiss me up from the sleep of death, and he's going to take me into his eternal home, and I'm going to live with him happily ever after. What does it sound like? It's the gospel. Do you think this actually disappears as time goes by? I don't think so. It, it actually gets worse. You know why? The Lord of the Rings. Return of the king. One day the king's going to return. And he's, he's going to re- restore everything. If you really had a chance to think about life the way it is, without devoiding it, without somehow decorating it more than you have to, if you really had a chance to really look at life or what it is, you're going, to want Jesus to, you're going to want Jesus to return. Think about it. As a missionary, I know. You know, I, I go to Africa. You know, I, I help out different people to dig up wells for people to, you know, people to provide uh, water to different villages. But then what? That's not going to solve all the problems. I go to Cambodia, and I, you know, provide, I, I, give, I give, like, you know, shoes to these orphans in Cambodia. But so what? That's temporary but they're going to be hungry again. You see, there's a problem with the Middle East, with the Middle East all, the, all the things that's going on in Israel. Many of us don't, don't, don't understand even half of, the, half of what's going on in the Middle East with Israel and Palestine. But if you really you know, look at the situation there, it's really, really hopeless. If you see this, Israel... Bombing Palestine, Palestine bombing Israel. They're fighting with each other. And if you talk to one of the Palestinian guys, you know, why do you, do, why do you hate Jews so much? You know, why, why, come on, can you, can, you just stop the, can, can you just stop this war? You know what they say? Well, my uncle is dead. It, he was killed by this Israeli soldier. And you go to Israel and you say, you know what? Can you stop this war? And can you just, you know, stop? You know, just forgive, just love each other. You know what, you know what they're going to say? They killed my father. Do you know why the Bible says tooth for a tooth, eye for an eye, life for a life? Many of us, when I was a little kid, when I looked at that, I said, oh, God is so stingy. You know, why, why, why couldn't he just say forgive? 
Well, God is so stingy for him to say tooth for tooth, eye for an eye, life for life. But if you really understand the human nature, God is a good God. You know why? Because there's not a single human being that's going to pay back tooth for tooth. If somebody knocks at a tooth, what does that person do? You would kill him. If that person knocks out, you know, somehow makes you blind, what do you do? You wipe out his entire family. That's the human nature. So what happens? Tooth, eyes. Eyes, life. Life, entire family. Entire family, village. One bomb, ten missiles. Hundred missiles, thousand missiles. You know what that is? Palestine and Israel. That's exactly what's going on. And do you think this is going to be solved? Wake up. It's not going to be solved. That's why Jesus says, in the end of human history, the prince of shalom, the prince of peace, he's going to return. He's going to resolve everything. And for you not to want that to happen is almost as if you're saying, you know what, everything's going to be fine. It's not going to be fine. And I want you to wake up to life. I want you to wake up to the reality out there. I want you to wake up to the calling that Jesus is giving us, saying, you know what, I'm going to return. Prepare. Wake up. And if you know what I want, prepare my way so that I can return and finish everything. There's one condition that must be achieved in order for Jesus to return. You know what that is? When the gospel reaches the ends of the earth, he's going to be able to return. That's one thing that he wants. Share the gospel to the ends of the earth, not to just, not to just you know, spread Christianity, not to just build churches. God is saying, take the gospel to the ends of the earth for one reason. You know what that is? For Jesus to return so that everything's going to be over. Time is up. So lastly, number three, very quickly, quick, quickly and I'm going to wrap it up. Number three, serve as much as you, serve as much as you, you have received. Serve as much as you have received. That's verses 40, uh, 45 to 48. Jesus says, you know what? Stay awake. Number two, manage. Number three, serve. How? Serve as much as you have received. For those much is given, Jesus is going to require much back from them. And everybody is given different portions. Do you realize that? I mean, I work in, uh, I work in China a lot of times. And I'm, I have an opportunity to meet defectors. North Korean defectors, North Korean refugees that escaped from uh, North Korea. And just recently, I met a guy, and I, I, I met a mother who lost her son in North Korea. Um, that, that lady was able to successfully escape from North Korea, but ended up um, leaving her son behind in North Korea, and he, he, un- he actually ended up um, getting martyred in North Korea. And this is what happened. Um, they, they actually asked him, he was arrested by the North Korean government, and if you, if you renounce Jesus, we're going to let you go. If you want to keep on saying that you believe in Jesus, we're going to have to kill you. And he, he chose death. He chose death. And you know how they killed him? You know, when you, when you go out there uh, to the highway, when they have the highway construction, how they pave the road, that huge roller car, the North Korean government would lay him down on, asp- uh, on, on the blacktop on the road. They would actually use the entire huge roller car to actually um, roll up, not from head down, from feet up. If you're head down, that's, that's, that's what is it, instant death. So the car would roll up from feet up. The blood's going to be piled up in your stomach. And his mother, who actually witnessed the death of her, uh, death of her son, she, she told me, Pastor Daniel, have you actually heard someone's guts exploding? That's, that's how he got killed. And what really amazed me more is this. So I asked him, so how did he accept Jesus Christ in North Korea? Do you know how he accepted Jesus Christ? Somebody actually escaped as the North Korean defector to escape, to, to escape in China. And hoping that he's going to be able to go to America or Korea. But he was introduced with the gospel by, the Chinese, by a Chinese missionary. He accepted Jesus Christ, and he really, you know, was transformed with the gospel. He says, you know what, now I can't go to Korea. Go to Korea. I can't go to America. I'm going to take this gospel that I have received. I'm going to take this back into my homeland, North Korea. I'm going to share this with my friends and families. So instead of coming out to Korea or to, to the U.S., 
he ended up taking the gospel back into North Korea, where he, has, he, he had escaped from, uh, to, to share the gospel to his families and friends. And when he crossed the Yanji River into North Korea, he can't take the entire 66 books of the Bible. You know why? Because you, you, you're going to be arrested. But what happened was um, he tears up the entire 66 books into 66 different books. And he would, as soon as he, he, he entered North Korea, he distributed the entire 66 books to different people. And the book of John was the book that this, this, uh, this young man has received. He was reading the book of John, and he, he couldn't believe how much he was loved by God. He accepted, Jesus, he accepted Jesus Christ. He accepted the gospel. His life was transformed. That's how he became a Christian, and he was able to go all the way to the point of martyrdom. He had one book. He had one book in the Bible to be able to die for Jesus Christ. But we have a problem. You know why? Because you and I have entire 66 six books, and we have no passion. There's several hundred books in, in, my, in my closet, se several Bibles stacked up, all dusty. We have, we have a church. Nobody tells us anything, even if we worship here. We don't get arrested. One day we'll die too. And when we go to the throne of God, there's us and there's a North Korean brother standing next to each other. Do you really think our God is going to be able, he's going he's gonna to judge us according to the same standard? For those much is given, God's going to demand much back from them. In other words, the things that we have, all the freedom, church, the Bibles, knowledge, all the resources, unless you, re unless you use them right, it's a curse. Let us pray.